Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. In March, I was supposed to be a presenter at the Canadian Mental Health Association, Alberta Division, virtual conference called Working Stronger, um, Building Resilient Workplaces in the Face of Challenges. So my theme and poster, which in which I represented Friends of Science had been accepted and it was called Indoctrination and Demoralization, Climate Change Fears and Alberta's Workforce. My poster overview read, since a clinical psychologist Margaret Klein Solomon developed the theme, Our House is on Fire, to emotionally drive the public into fear and force political action on climate change, people around the world have been spiraling into depression and existential angst. In Alberta, this has been exacerbated by a visit from Greta Thunberg, who frequently parrots Solomon's phrases, and by the Alberta Narratives Project, which was led by Climate George Marshall and Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. The Alberta Narratives Project hosted roundtable sessions across Alberta, attempting to convince Albertans that the oil and gas industry are dead and dangerous to the existence of the planet. The facts and evidence show otherwise. This presentation deconstructs the Alberta narrative and the global tar sands campaign that has demoralized Albertans in all walks of life, destroyed our economy, and led to a serious rise in mental health issues, family violence, divorce, job loss, and sadly, suicide. So on the evening of March 8th, my poster was posted online on the conference website, along with four other posters, and by the morning it was gone. <laughs> so climate cancel culture uh, hit me from an unexpected angle. <laughs> now, um, you know, of course, uh, I was quite upset about that. I checked with the coordinator who said that some of the sponsors objected to it which is kind of funny because the sponsors uh, tended to be in the industry of health and well-being. So you'd think that they would want to know what things are causing trauma for the Alberta workforce. After all, this is about being stronger when facing challenges. So since I was not able to present my poster at the event, I'll just walk through it for you. So um, here it is. It's called Indoctrination and Demoralization, Climate Change Fears and Alberta's Workforce. So the first sentence here says, Ostracism, the kiss of social death. That's a quote from Kipling D. Williams. He's a psychologist and he studied how rejection affects people and how being ostracized affects people. And there are studies showing that uh, being rejected and ostracized has an equivalent impact in your brain to being actually physically hurt. So uh, it's not a simple thing to uh, ostracize and reject people. And that's really what the Tar Sands campaign has all been about. And also the climate change activism world is uh, about calling people names, denier, to shut down debate, to ostracize anyone who holds a dissenting view. And uh, here I quote Maria Hoda. Um, she was a social worker who did the first big study of unemployment and its effect on the population back in the 1930s. There was an Austrian town called Marienthal where the population, the employed population was put out of work overnight. So uh, the impacts on people are, are very severe, as we know in Alberta anyway, but, but this was the first study. And, and here is an excerpt from a, a paper about her work. The unemployed suffer from a lack of purpose, exclusion from the larger society, and relative social isolation. So I think most of us can actually um, uh, commiserate with that, having gone through isolation and lockdown in the past year. Maybe people have a better grip of how terrible it is to actually be unemployed. So if we walk through the poster, in the first section, 
It's about the foreign-funded tar sands campaign is decimating Alberta's workforce through despair, public denigration, and demoralization. So people are probably not aware of just how important the oil sands are to Canada. So the Alberta oil sands forecast for 2009 was that there would be a growth of employment across Canada from 75,000 jobs in 2010 to 905,000 jobs in 2035. The generation of 2.1 trillion in economic stimulus over the next 25 years, which would have been from 2010 to 2035. The development contributing $105 billion to provincial taxes and over $311 billion in federal taxes and the collection of over $350 billion in royalties from 2010 to 2035. So that's uh, from uh, an oil sands developer group paper from 2009. Now you can see over here in this corner, this is a graph from the Alberta Economic Dashboard. You can see that uh, Alberta's economy peaked and then crashed completely. And it's still way on the downside. I think in 2015, there was a Calgary Herald article saying that there would be a $60 billion loss in investment in the next year, $60 billion in one year. And that downward trend continued. And you can see here how tragically the suicides correlate. Look at this, 2015, a huge spike. And following that, really very similar highs, very tragic. So I can imagine people who are experiencing this job loss and perhaps loss of their homes and, and uh, sense of identity, especially men. For men, work is very integral to their whole identity. So when a man loses a job, it's quite different than when a woman loses a job, mostly because women are kind of tied to various cycles of homemaking and caring for children. I know that may sound very sexist these days, but it's quite true still to this day. And this is the finding that, um, that uh, Maria Hoda and her colleagues found as well, because women were concerned with, you know, making sure meals were on time, that children got to school, got up, got fed. Um, these kind of cyclical patterns kept their mood up. Whereas men without work, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, they have no particular pattern unless they have a really good hobby they, and, and the ability to do it. Uh, like, let's say you have a tool shed and, and a shop at home and you can go and work with wood or something like that or build your sailboat. Unless you have something really gratifying like that that you can do with your hands as a man, it's often devastating. You're at a total loss for what to do. So women fare much better when they're facing unemployment. And, and one of the big problems is many of the people who were unemployed are scientists and professionals. Uh, they're people who really know their stuff. They really know math and physics and science. And they're being unemployed by these counterfactual claims by activists against experts. So this creates a cognitive dissidence for Albertans. It destroys Alberta's international reputation for investment, which exacerbates the investment problems and creates a domino effect job loss. Because when you see big oil pulling out of Alberta, then other companies look at Alberta and say, well, I don't know, maybe we should stay away. So, uh, if you look at this chart here, this is from British Petroleum, but you can find a very similar chart in the International Energy Agency or any uh, like the U.S. Energy Information Agency, U.S. EIA. It shows you that actually oil, gas and coal are still the primary movers of this world. So the claims by activists that coal and gas and oil are being phased out, nobody will use them anymore, is ludicrous. And uh, this, there's a tiny little line here, this little orange line, that's renewables. So that's nothing. And renewables are all made from oil, gas and coal. So um, oil is not going away as an industry anytime soon. In fact, the world uses three cubic miles of oil equivalent energy every year, 
and one of those cubic miles is oil. So the oil sands team leads, for instance, the people working in charge of teams in the oil sands are typically people who hold a PhD. They have 10 years of specific oil sands experience. And Alberta had a cadre of something like 90,000 professional geoscientists and engineers and thousands of skilled tradespeople. So this is an extremely high proportion of very skilled people in this population. It's one of the highest per capita ratios of engineers and geoscientists in the world right here in Alberta. So when people say, oh, you know, they're skeptics because they're attached to oil and gas. No, they're skeptics about climate change because they know the facts and they're scientists and engineers. They know how to read the data properly. And you can see here that these are the world's biggest oil producers. Canada's on that list. So on this list, we're, we're at number four. So we, we waver around four or five, but you can see our competitor nations certainly would benefit from us not being on the market. And Canada, primarily Alberta here, is in the top five oil producers worldwide, but there's no such anti-oil campaign like the tar sands campaign going on in any of these countries. Doesn't that strike you as strange? So, uh, many people today have forgotten some of the publicity of the tar sands campaign. So here are some examples. Um, it was called the Great American Carbon Bomb, which is total baloney. Um, here is uh, leading the public into emergency mode. This is Margaret Klein Solomon trying to scare the pants off everyone. She's a clinical psychologist. I think that that's unethical. You're supposed to use those skills for healing people, not hurting them. And here's uh, Greta citing our houses on fire, which is the phrase that uh, Margaret Klein Solomon uses in her um, uh, diatribes. And then, of course, here's the Rethink Alberta campaign, which was set up by the Natural uh, Resources Defense Council of the States, thinking of visiting Alberta, Canada, Think again, rethink Alberta. So, you know, our mountains covered in tar, uh, build, big billboards all over the states ran this way. And uh, what happened is it made other people in Alberta hate people who worked in the oil sands. Because if you're working in tourism and this is being smeared on you as a tourist operator, then you're gonna like hate those people who work in the oil sands for ruining your business when in fact it's not their fault, it's the tar sands campaign. And then on top of all of this, what did these experts in Alberta have to put up with? Uh, the disbelief that the Alberta Narratives Project was funded by taxpayers, engaged lifelong anti-oil activists to do roundtable talks with Albertans about non-existent energy transition. So they actually hired this fellow named Climate George, who's been a lifelong anti-oil activist. At one point in his career, he was in favor of direct action that actually can hurt the entire society and put many people at risk. But he graduated from that and became kind of a climate missionary. So he came to Alberta to try and tell us that the facts are not what they are. These are the facts here. This is the facts and evidence about world energy consumption. And he was hired with taxpayers' money. Actually, it was through the former NDP government to come here and, and proselytize. So they had roundtable meetings all over the province. They met with hundreds of thousands of people, actually, and uh, tried to make oil sands and oil and gas workers feel bad about their their excellent credentials. So you can see this is uh, layering um, humiliation on top of the already dire circumstance of an unemployed person who went to school, to university, probably for like seven years to get their their qualifications. And it should be noted also that professional geoscientists and professional engineers have both ethical and legal uh, obligations in their profession that these climate activists don't have at all. You know, the climate activists can say anything, and they do. 
but they have they will never bear any responsibility for their their misleading information um, so anyhow in my abstract it was that the tar sands campaign indoctrination has turned alberta into a national and global pariah demoralized the suddenly employed experts and skilled trades and devastated retail workers because of course there's a trickle down effect if you have 90,000 people who used to work in the oil sands at good paying jobs and a very large percentage of them are unemployed well then they don't have the money to buy a new home buy a new car their partner cannot go and have whatever beauty treaty that, treatment they might want or massage you know all the trickle down um, enjoyments restaurants they all start to collapse as well so in the introduction, I did a comparative review of Yehoda's Marienthal, Employment and Unemployment, and Effects on Unemployment Combined with Kipling D. Williams' Research on Ostracism. The methods were to review the Tar Sands campaign efforts and timeline of job loss and investment drop, and related socioeconomic crises indicators like suicide. Media review of additional reputational hits to Alberta's unemployment, and a review of counterfactual government-funded Alberta narratives. The results are that there's a direct correlation between the Tar Sands campaign and socioeconomic and psychological destruction of Alberta individuals, which goes far beyond job loss. And the conclusions are that individual self-worth is disastrously affected when society turns against a sector with counterfactual disinformation used against people already made vulnerable by unemployment and uncertainty. And in discussion, how should society handle the role of media and climate activists when engaged against scientific and engineering experts in a manner that destroys provincial economy? How to address the complex individual mental health concerns in this convoluted context. So just imagine I was not able to present this poster because of cancel culture. Imagine that you're an unemployed professional engineer, professional geoscientist, tradesperson, retail worker, small business owner, and you're losing everything and losing your mind and you go to get help and you try to explain that these things are happening to you in your industry, what kind of acceptance will you get from the mental health professionals in Alberta? To my mind, you won't get much help because they probably won't believe any of this. They probably don't know anything about it. And that's exactly why I wanted to make that presentation to that group, but I was denied that opportunity. And just so you know, the Can Canadian Mental Health Association is a largely tax-funded organization. I'm a taxpayer, so I was denied an opportunity to present my case. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.